So my approach to marketing is that there are no magic channels because if a magic channel appears, it's transitive because other marketers are going to discover that advantage and bid up the cost. So I'll give you an example. Right. Hey, everyone's putting their money into AdWords, into Google, and no one's going to Bing. And then uh, OpenAI gets announced and you know Microsoft gets the upper hand and are they going to overturn the Google monolith with you know OpenAI? And marketers jumped into that and you know it was a bargain for the first few weeks and then everyone got in the market and things went up and and the market rationalized itself so you know i think we can always as marketers do a better job within channels and be smarter because every channel is diminishing marginal return and every channel is addressing a different part of the funnel and the buying journey so we constantly have to be rebalancing our portfolios but it's it's very dynamic so really what i focus on instead of a particular channel and by the way i've got a, an amazing dg team that is going to tell me the right channels to focus on um, what i really focus on is do we as a marketing organization and even as a business have a really clear understanding of our customers needs and pain points are we delivering solutions aligned to those needs and are we articulating a consistent and compelling story a narrative that aligns to those pain points across the entire buyer journey. That story may be different in if, if a particular channel is um, above the funnel versus a channel that you use to reach a buyer in, in mid funnel of, of the buyer journey. So the message can vary by channel, but the, the message needs to be consistent. You are listening to Power Marketing with Kevin Lee. Kevin and his agency Did It have helped thousands of businesses win through superior marketing, as have his books, articles, speaking engagements, and the eMarketing Association Power Marketing Podcasts. Here's Kevin. I'm super excited to be here today with uh, Des Cahill, who is the Chief Marketing Officer at Tapalti. So uh, we'll start off with a, a, a bit of a, you know, Elevator pitch question. So for those folks who aren't aware of what you guys do, uh, what's the elevator pitch these days? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you for having me on the podcast, Kevin. It's great to be here. So Topalti helps companies grow by making worldwide payments easy. So we help finance teams work smarter on their spending. Uh, and that includes accounts payable, procurement, expenses, and mass payments to like affiliates and creators. And, you know, fundamentally, we're about we believe that spending money and time efficiently is the key to growth, particularly in this economic environment. And, and maybe I can give an example of a customer of ours, and that would help solidify in viewers and listeners' minds. So Amazon Twitch is a customer. Uh, they stream 70 million hours of video globally a day. They have 50, 000, over 50,000 creators located all over the world. Only 20% of their traffic is from the United, is in the US or is native English. Um, so for those 50,000 plus creators, how does Twitch pay those creators for the revenue that they're generating? How do they do that efficiently, quickly to make sure they're in legal compliance uh, with tax and anti-money laundering in multiple currency and multiple forms of payment? All, all growing rapidly? And the answer is, is to Palti. We make that easy because we've done the hard work of, of building a global payment platform across 196 countries and 120 currencies. Um, so we're really all about helping companies spend money efficiently and empowering finance teams to do that. Cool. Well, well Twitch is obviously gigantic, right? Uh, so at what point does it become a sweet spot where you'd say, oh, they should definitely call your team? You right. know, it's obviously at a certain point when you're not doing a lot of transaction volume, it's probably too small for you guys. Uh, and, and if you can handle Twitch, then obviously you can handle anybody. So at what point should people start to think about, you know, hey, the Topalti team could probably help me? Well, yeah, I would say that, you know, we have large customers like Twitch and Roblox and Canva, but those companies have grown with us. They were much smaller when they started with us and we can scale. But the sweet spot for us would be specializing in fast growing uh, mid sized businesses, anywhere from 50 employees to 2,500 
employees. Uh, and these bi businesses typically have a high volume of payments they need to make to suppliers. They may be ex they may have global suppliers or a global entity. They're starting to expand internationally or partners internationally. They want to move away from physical checks and Excel tracking, and they want to move to a more, you know, automated, efficient, compliant approach to payments. Because I like I like to say every company today is global. It's not just enterprises. You know, even even small businesses and and mid market companies are global in some way. So that is the sweet spot for us. And I'd say that the, the total addressable market for that global mid-market uh, high growth company, it's, it's massive. It, it's, it's really, really big. We, we're at 3,000 customers today and uh, we're really just getting going. There's, there's a lot more to do. And you know, according to some analysts in the space, less than 5% of these companies are using some kind of... Um, accounts payable or finance automation solution. The rest of them are still, you know, checks and um, Excel. So it's really a lot of uh, white space available for us. Well, in a previous life, I actually had a, an email uh, newsletter company called briefme.com, which uh, I, I eventually ended up shutting down, but it ran pretty solid from 99 through 2002. And we were paying a lot of uh, freelance Editors and I do remember that was a huge hassle, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, and they could the, be they could be anywhere. It could be any currency. And how do you convert currency and get a good rate? Yeah. And is it compliant? And what's the tax reporting? So we make that all simple. Topalti uh, in Hebrew means uh, we'll handle it, and that's right. our philosophy. We want companies to concentrate on their growth. We'll handle the complexity behind the scenes. So one of the challenges we had was in the onboarding process, right? So we had, you know, just some simple web forms that people would fill out in order to become compliant. And then, you know, set, then we'd have them, I think at the time, they might have even been, been faxing us identity verification <laughs> and information right. like that. Uh, obviously, since 99 uh, or 98, things have ch changed a lot. So do you guys help facilitate that portion? Of Absolutely. Absolutely. Well? Yeah, that's that's a big part of of our value add, both from you know simple supplier onboarding. Well, I say it's simple, but it's, as you pointed out, it's complex. Where are you located? What's your tax status? What's what's the, your tax information? How do I collect that? What do I report to the IRS? When do I report it? Um, so we we do uh, simple supplier onboarding, and then we even go deeper into procurement. So you've got a supplier, you're a manufacturer, small manufacturing company, or you're relying on a supplier. How do you um, get contract terms in the system? How do you make sure that um, they're not sanctioned? Uh, you're able to do business with them. So we take care of all that complexity and, again, simplify it. That's kind of our mantra so that our customers and their finance teams and their, their, their business leaders can concentrate on growth. Yeah, that's great. Um, and, and you solve a problem that that most people probably don't even think about, which was uh, back when I was running Brief Me and we had, uh, I think, about uh, several hundred uh, freelance contributors. Um, one of them signed up to be freelance just so that he could forge a check against our account because we were actually mailing out checks. Right. So there was fraud there. But these days, you know, when I think about running Did It and, you know, the, uh, the accountants who audit our books there, they're equally concerned about the ability to have invoices processed fraudulently, right? Which is protecting like an insider job, right? Which was right. right from that. So I'd love to hear sort of, it seems like you guys put a lot of controls in place to make sure that- Yeah, yeah, for sure. We, we've been doing this, we've been you know building out our system for over 10 years. So we've been doing this a long, long time. Uh, and uh, removing risk is a big part of it. Number one is moving from checks to uh, electronic payment enables you to introduce a lot of controls, number one. Um, and I, I would say on average, we found in our research that over four different systems are used in making a supplier payment. So there's a lot of opportunity for not only fraud, but just inconsistencies and errors to creep mistakes, in. Yeah. Type an extra zero. Now, was that fraud or was that a mistake? Either way, you're out significant dollars. Um, but in addition to you know errors um, or, or fraud, you have the risk of uh, inadvertently paying people that are on Treasury Department sanction lists, and you know those have grown uh, in in recent years. And uh, the AP team needs to navigate the sea of regulatory changes, 
They need to ensure that you're in tax compliance. And we all know the tax code is constantly changing. So in addition to, to risk uh, of fraud, of error, of paying um, sanctioned um, uh, suppliers or vendors or partners and uh, tax compliance, you're, you're introducing a lot of risk if you're doing it sort of the old, old school way. So we built out our system at, at the core with that strong supplier onboarding, knowing our regulations, um, what are regulatory changes. And we are a licensed money transmitter in the United States and across 50 states. And because of that, we are regulated and, and we have to be in compliance with all these things. So again, we've done the hard work of simplifying a very complex problem by spending the 10 years, you know, building out this, the, doing the engineering work and the, the partnering work and the financial uh, engineering work to make this simple for our customers. So, so the, um, on the banking side, I guess the ACH is something we're used to here in the States, but is, is how have you had to deal with that internationally when, when things like ACH are not necessarily available, you know, for every bank, have you guys sort of fixed that as well? Yeah, there's certainly a lot of variants um, around the world. And, uh, you know, we have an office in in London. We just opened an office in Amsterdam. And then in addition to that, for our U.S. customers, we're supporting payments to suppliers, vendors, contractors, and employees around, around the globe. Um, and it's not as easy as, oh, we'll just wire ACH to everybody because, well, if you're partner is, is in Tbilisi, Georgia, or Armenia, or wherever, uh, it might be a little bit more difficult problem. So we've built our global payment network across 196 countries. Uh, we can pay in 120 currencies. We can pay in six different payment methods, whether that's ACH, global ACH, to a local banking network, PayPal, prepaid debit card. Um, yeah, maybe not every Twitch um, creator or Roblox creator has a bank account mm -hmm. well, or maybe they prefer to get paid in PayPal. So it's a um, considered problem when you look at it just from the scale of paying all these different people and these different, uh, all these different members of your ecosystem in different situations. And then you look at it from the finance point of view. And if you're a finance team, you have to manage multiple currencies because you can't just assume that you can pay everyone in dollars. Um, so how do you more, how do, how does your finance team effectively manage, especially if you're someone like like Twitch? How do you effectively manage those currencies? Um, it's it's again it's it's a hard problem, and it's one of the reasons why we're growing and uh, doing well is we're we're able to deliver on this stuff. Cool. Well, now uh, you putting your marketing hat on for yourself, right? Um, obviously, you've got a multi-channel marketing strategy and you're using a variety of, uh, of types of marketing. Are there ones that, that sort of really float to the surface for you, ones that you believe for you reaching, you know, the folks who need these kinds of payment services that, that either will outperform or are consistently outperforming for you? Kevin, if I can tell you, which of my marketing channels outperform the other ones, but then I'm going to have to kill you. <laughs> so I don't want to do that. So I'm going to adroitly sidestep the question. No, I'll, I'll seriously. So my approach to marketing is that there are no magic channels because if a magic channel appears, it's transitive because other marketers are going to discover that advantage and bid up the cost. So I'll give you an example. Right. Hey, Everyone's putting their money into AdWords, into Google, and no one's going to Bing. And then uh, OpenAI gets announced and, you know, Microsoft gets the upper hand. And are they going to overturn the Google monolith with, you know, OpenAI? And marketers jumped into that. And, you know, it was a bargain for the first few weeks. And then everyone got in the market and things went up and, and the market rationalized itself. So, you know, I think we can always as marketers do a better job within channels and be smarter because every channel is diminishing marginal return and every channel is addressing a different part of the funnel and the buying journey. So we constantly have to be rebalancing our portfolios, but it's, it's very dynamic. So really what I focus on 
instead of a particular channel. And by the way, I've got a, an amazing DG team that is going to tell me the right channels to focus on. Um, what I really focus on is do we as a marketing organization and even as a business have a really clear understanding of our customers' needs and pain points? Are we delivering solutions aligned to those needs? And are we articulating a consistent and compelling story, a narrative that aligns to those pain points across the entire buyer journey? That story may be different in if, if a particular channel is um, above the funnel versus a channel that you use to reach a buyer in, in mid funnel of, of the buyer journey. So the message can vary by channel, but the, the message needs to be consistent. Um, so anyway, that's that's something that as a CMO, I think is is really important to uh, to bring to the, t- the executive team and, and bring to the marketing organization. Right, right. And so when your demand gen team is sort of in the process of creating demand or harvesting existing demand, which is what search is really good at is people type right. in search terms when they're feeling maximum pain, <laughs> right? Right, so high you've got high that. Yeah, high intent, right? Yeah, and and so, but uh, demand gen is really more the people may not even realize there's a solution, right? And so you need to basically educate them and and bring them through that process of, of becoming aware that you're even there. I would imagine the pain that's felt at different layers of the organization is quite different, right? So an accounts payable person feels different pain than the chief financial officer does. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about how you're trying to say, okay, here's my marketing budget. I need to work at the CFO level, but also need to worry about the, you know, I make the lives easier for the AP team. So like they're influencing this decision potentially. So how do you- Yeah, there's there's the AP team and there's the expenses team and there's the procurement team. Right. And then there's the partner and affiliate and creator operations team. Right. So there's lots of teams impacted by this. So I think for the smart strategy is to go higher, is to go mm-hmm. up. And then, you you know, in, in the top of the funnel, you can go up and then you can come down as you work through the funnel and, and more of the um, set of employees that are going to be impacted by the purchasing decision are affected. But, you know, our first message is really talking to the CFO Mm-hmm. And in many cases, even talking to the CEO and COO, because remember, these are small business to mid-market companies, at least when we initially work with them and then they grow, um, you know, doing payments, procurement, expenses, and um, creator affiliate management well is a big competitive advantage. So we definitely um, go high with the message of, you know, broad avoidance, efficiency, scaling, investing in growth. And then as we go through the um, buyer journey, we definitely have messages and demos um, for AP leaders, uh, procurement leaders, expense leaders to show them, you know, this is something that's going to make your work life better. This is going to like automate the mundane stuff, um, remove risk out of the dangerous stuff, and then enable you to get your clothes done faster, to get your tasks done faster, get employees paid out. And then you can work on other projects, maybe, you know, more strategic projects or projects around company growth. Right, right. Well, it sounds like you, you have to, you're creating content that address all of the needs at the different layers, uh, but th- that you tend to stay big picture sort of at the umbrella level, primarily initially, right. because that's where, where the more senior person is like to come likely to come across your message, but a lot of that seems like it would work. That the same content might actually have multiple functions in that it it works as an earned media asset, but it also potentially works as part of a paid media strategy as a landing page, for example, for somebody who's expressed a specific you know issue that they're they're trying to solve. And I'd love to hear about how you go through the strategic decision making. Like, okay, we actually need a new piece of content because we we've identified an important enough segment that. We're going to go ahead and create maybe a microsite or a page or whatever right. that addresses that need. Yeah, and that's a great question, Kevin. And oftentimes it it occurs. Um, excuse me. We've got a lot of great um, developers in the company and product managers, and often it's, hey, we've got a new innovation. We've got, you know, we were introducing AI. We partnered with Open AI, and we got a Chat GPT powered chat or invoice matching to automate it, or we've got a new expenses solution or a new treasury map, you know, new things are constantly coming out. So that demands, um, okay, where does that fit into our overall 
message hierarchy of how we talk to the CFO and to the rest of the constituents in the finance organization. And let's not talk about it in terms of a product and features. Let's talk about it in terms of use cases and pain points. Well, number one, how does it fit into the higher level story of we make company, we, we enable companies to um, spend more effectively? So how does it fit into the top level narrative? Mm-hmm. Then how does it, second level, how does it fit into use cases and customer pain points? And then at then later in the journey, then let's talk about feature sets and you know comparisons. I think within technology companies, um, and you know I've been doing this for a, a long time, and I'm here in you know Silicon Valley in the, the heart of the beast of the B2B SaaS technology world. And uh, you know I'd say every tech company I've ever worked into, every technology company has a tendency to lead with features and uh, why we're better and why our product is better. And customers, they don't want to go there right away, right? They they need an emotional resonance and connection with your company to feel like you understand their pain and you're going to be a valuable partner. And then once you have that connection at a high level, you can then later in the buying journey, introduce the the detail and the specifics. So anyway, I, I maybe I didn't answer your question as succinctly, but I think it was important to like lay out how I think that system works. And then what happens is that really content creation in a B2B organization, SaaS organization is is a distributed function. Yes, you have a content team. Yes, you have a web team, but we have subject matter experts in product marketing and product management uh, executives. Our CFO is one of our leading spokespeople. So lots of content is being developed around the organization. What I think a messaging framework can do, which is what I just described, is give people a map to think about where am I plugging my my content into? Who's the buyer? Who's the audience? And what stage of the buying cycle or where are they in the funnel? Right. So we're talking to them in the right voice and at the right level at the right time. So you hear a lot about influencer marketing and B2C, right? But do you feel like influencer marketing has a place in B2B as well um, for you know marketers to engage with thought leaders? you know, uh, in in a B2B category? Yeah, absolutely, Kevin. I I would say that, you know, it's not so much a TikTok or or YouTube influencer per se, uh, but if we define influencer a little bit more broadly as anyone who could influence the buyer journey, it's certainly true in in B2B and certainly true for Topalti. So I'd say, you know, traditional analysts, you know, Gartner, Forrester, um, IDC, and there's certainly a lot of boutique firms that range from you know one person to five people. Um, another category of influencer would be awards. A little self promotion here. Topalti is one of 15 companies in the U.S. to be named to the Deloitte Fast 500 and 5,000 list for five consecutive years. Go team! Um, and then at a more scale level, uh, review sites like Trust Radius, G2, Captera, GetApp. Um, we're we're top rated in all of them with like really high scores, and I won't you know bang on my chest more about that. But yeah, um, I, I think those are a really effective balance between that Gartner Forrester traditional analyst and that you know traditional view of an influencer person is is these review sites are, are pretty cool, and um, we've done a really good job of uh, making ourselves uh, aware and, and getting reviewed on those sites. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. Um, in the past, it seemed like the only content that was co-created between B two B companies and their clients was the testimonial, right? But increasingly, uh, you know, one thing we've been experimenting with with our B two B clients, and I've also seen it done effectively elsewhere, is sort of co-creating content that go goes beyond a testimonial into sort of best practices or educational content, where the the, the client is actually assisting in either the creation. Or demonstration of ah uh, yes you know right. have you guys been playing with that at all? I think customers are the best uh, validators of our um, value to our customers, and you know stage one is sort of logos on the site. Stage two of customer marketing is uh, customer testimonials, as you alluded to. And now what you're talking about is how do we get to stage three, which is we actively have customers out there acting as an important 
um, advocate, whether it's in a public forum or in word of mouth. Um, my, I've, I've been at Spalti six weeks, so it's it's something that uh, I, I totally want to get to. I, I, I in other companies, I've uh, used that technique and found it incredibly uh, effective. Kevin, so 2023 is the year of AI. It will be obviously coined as the year of AI, and you've got that factored into your product roadmap. You mentioned some innovations there, but I'd be curious to hear how you think it'll change the broader B2B marketing landscape. Yeah, it's definitely a major change in the technology landscape. I, I think it's right up there with the iPhone, uh, cloud computing, uh, and other you know, seminal changes. So we, we did a survey recently of, of business leaders in US and Europe and found that 80% of business leaders say they're excited about opportunities with uh, with generative AI uh, for applications to finance. And, you know, in my just in my own little world, I asked my Topalti marketing team a few weeks ago to come up with some generative AI use cases. And a week later, I had collected 44 different use cases, 24 of which were already in testing or production. And they range from you know, personal productivity, help me write, I, I need to ideate for a blog post, to generating code for our website, generating new assets for our website, like payment calculators to generate uh, organic traffic, uh, and then a lot of vendor AI capability. So I think generative AI is here, and uh, my marketing team and the rest of the Tipalti organization is already embracing it. And then in term for our own customers, uh, we announced recently that we partnered, we've partnered. we partnered with OpenAI and we're using their GPT-4 technology to um, strengthen Topalti Pi, which is our, our sort of payables intelligence automation engine. And we're automatically scanning uh, incoming invoices and automatically coding those correctly into the general ledger, into the ERP system, which probably doesn't sound like a lot to two marketers, but to a you know an accounts payable team uh finance team to a controller to a, a cfo that that's that's a really big step forward in automation and then we've also got uh, an ask pi chatbot uh that is now powered by uh open ai gpt4 and it lets um finance professionals just ask questions about um you know hey what's this what's the sum total of the payments i made internationally last month Hey, can you give me my payments, the most in arrears? What's my highest paid supplier, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a great way to pull, you know, intelligence and, and data out of the system um, with simple, um, you know, in, in plain language. So we'll, we'll be doing a lot more. We've got a lot more planned, um, but I, I think this will be the year of AI for sure. I agree yeah. with that. I've certainly seen huge productivity gains on my coding teams with the co-pilots and the sort of clones of co-pilot where it, 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 it yeah. it's a dev cycle pretty significantly, Absolutely. but, but only for good coders. We find that like a mediocre or poor coder is still a poor coder, but they're just a, a faster poor coder. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe that's analogous to uh, marketing, right? And, you know, there's always a fear, and that we you know, went through this when we introduced um, ML-based AI solutions at a, a, at a previous company. There's always that narrative about, well, is it going to replace me? No, it's it's a machine. Uh, it's it's not really intelligent. It doesn't have judgment. It hallucinates. It's something. It's a tool to help you be a better marketer. It's not replacing marketers. It's a tool to help you be a better finance person. It's not replacing finance people. It's freeing you up to do, you know, more strategic tasks, and yeah, same thing with with coding. Yep, yeah, but it's funny. Uh, you know, I recently discovered a a a bard hallucination when I looked something up, and it it came up with the uh, what what is coined as a hallucination. So I mentioned it to my wife, who's a psychologist, and she said, "No, that's not a hallucination. That's a delusion." Right? She said that it's sort of miscoined. Uh, where, you know, obviously hallucination sounds better, an AI hallucination sounds better than an AI delusion, but it believes that what it's saying. So, so it's an aspirational hallucination. <laughs> yeah, <perhaps. laughs> I'm going to write that down. I like that. <laughs> so, so, uh, 
So yeah, I mean, I, I certainly look forward to watching your continued uh, journey now. You know, now that you're sort of in the seat for a little while, it sounds like you've got uh, a, a, a rocket ship that that you can take. You know, take pretty far because it's it solves some really big problems. So I'm really excited to see where you guys take it. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, I'm really I'm really fortunate. Uh, Jeff joined a great company, great marketing team, and um, I hope I can. Uh, bring some leadership and some uh, ideas and uh, we're going to take the rocket ship further and farther. Great. Thanks so much for joining me. Thanks, Kevin. It's been a pleasure. Kevin Lee's Power Marketing is available on all your favorite podcast networks. Kevin loves helping businesses excel at marketing. Having marketing challenges? Just like Santa in the Miracle on 34th Street, if Kevin can't help you, he'll know someone who can. Find him on LinkedIn, subscribe, or follow.